to remain standing for the reading of God's holy word from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through 32. Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. Give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So ends the reading of God's holy, inspired, and infallible word. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word today. We pray, Lord, that as we study your word, as we are fed by the bread of life in your word, we, we pray, Lord, that you would conform us more and more to your will and to your honor and to your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. As we have been for a while, we are in that section of Ephesians where Paul is making some application to the doctrinal section that he has been uh, taking us through and or had taken us through in the first three chapters with his emphasis seeming to be on the fact that we are one body in Christ. And now Paul has transitioned to telling us what it is like to live as those who are redeemed and who are redeemed as one body. And in the previous few verses, Paul has presented to the Ephesians the challenge of living the Christian life with its rhythm of putting off the old man and, and putting off the new. These, these next eight verses, which we just read, reflect the dual nature of that, our sanctification, that the dual action of the off and the on, the yes and the no. The destroying and the building. Now, as I as I looked at this passage and tried to figure out how best to uh, preach it this morning, uh, usually I like to have a nice, tidy outline of of some sort. And as I looked more and more at this passage, I thought I just want to let the rhythm of the passage speak to us. This morning, I want us to be able to notice the back and forth that Paul uh, gives us, the, the push and the pull, as Paul intended, the off and the on, because he keeps going back and forth between them throughout these verses. So I, I want us to be able to feel that, that, that back and forth. I also want us to notice that much of the putting off and the putting on in this passage, passage is not just for the sake of the saint themselves. Not even just for the glory of God, which it is. But he also notes it as benefiting the saints as a whole. Benefiting the other members of the body of Christ. The saints who surround us. So we can, we can say that this is about the treatment of others in the light of the mercies of God in Christ. So let's begin our, our time in going through this just verse by verse. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth 
with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. So Paul begins here by talking about our speech. Putting away falsehood. Stopping lying to one another. And that makes sense to us as Christians. It should make sense to us because God is the God of truth. He is truth. His word is truth. And therefore, it makes sense to us that we ought to be those who are people of truth. And he tells us to speak truth to his neighbor. Again, he's making a reference there. If you, you caught it when we read Zechariah earlier, he's repeating that theme. Let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Let each of you speak truth to his neighbor. He says, for we are members of one another. For we are members of one another. So, not just the fact that we're to speak truth because we are uh, people of the truth, of God, of the truth of his word, but we're to speak truth because we are members one of another. As it says elsewhere in the scripture, we're to speak the truth in love to one another, for one another. If, if we think about what Paul is saying, Paul is saying, in a sense, not completely, but in a sense, when you lie to others, when you're lying especially to members of the body of Christ, you're lying to yourself. Because we are members of one another. You're doing the body no good in your lying. In your lying. Instead, you speak truth to one another in love. Now, we're going to see how this carries out even further as we get into these other matters of speech and treatment of one another. But he begins here by telling us to speak truth to our neighbor. Speak the truth to our neighbor. And the best way we can speak the truth to our neighbor, I think, is to be reminding one another of the truths of Scripture and encouraging one another from the truths of Scripture. Now, in verse 26, he says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, what's interesting is later on, he tells us in verse 31 to put away anger. So how can he say in one place, put away anger, and in another, be angry and do not sin? Well, I think in the, in the other case, later on we're going to see that we are talking about acting out in anger. Because we can get that sense from the things that surround it. But is it possible to be angry and not sin? I'll give you a perfect example. We could talk about Jesus overturning the, the, the changers' tables in the temple. We, that's usually the example that we give. But I've been pretty angry this week. I've been pretty angry because I've been seeing these reports, and it seems like day after day, sometimes three and four times a day, about the things that are going on to my dear brothers in Pakistan. Fortunately, no one I know personally these churches have been burnt, but I'm angry over this. My brothers in Pakistan are angry over this. They are mourning over this as they watch the persecution of their fellow saints. Should we be angry? Over such things, should we be angry at the mistreatment of even one brother of another, as we've heard about? Should it anger us? I think these are the kinds of things that we can be angry about, but not sin over. I think what we need to learn is that there are those things that will anger us. Righteous anger. And there will be things in our lives that upset us. 
Maybe even things that God is doing or not doing in our lives. But we cannot let our anger override our love for God and our love for our neighbor. We cannot let our anger or override our love for God and our neighbor. What are we to do? Let's look at one more part of this here before I get too far along. He says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. And I'm going to pair that with the next verse. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Because I think those two, we, we don't want to separate them out in one sense because I think they're related to one another. Literally, verse 27 says, give no opportunity or give no place. To the devil. It's a very literal rendering of it. Give no place to the devil. It means don't give the devil any room. Don't give the devil an opportunity. Sometimes we've seen it translated, don't give the devil a foothold. It doesn't really say foothold here. I guess they get that from giving him a place, giving him an opportunity, giving him something to hold on to. When we do not let this, when we let the sun go down on our anger, and we continue our anger on into the next day, and the next day, and the next day, we become grudge bearers. And when we are grudge bearers, we have given room to the devil. When we hold on to our anger and our bitterness, as we're going to see, we give opportunity to the devil. So give no opportunity to the devil. Do not let the sun go down on your anger because the devil is always trying to make room in our hearts and our lives and in our minds. He's always trying to do that. And one way he does that is by upsetting us. By pointing out to us where God is being not nice to us. Where God hasn't done what we've asked him to do. Where other people are, are succeeding or achieving or, or thriving and flourishing while people who are righteous are suffering. And he tries to take room. He tries to make a place for himself. What are we to do with our anger? Whether it be righteous anger, whether it be an unrighteous anger, whether it be because we feel like we are being treated unfairly by Maybe even by God himself, which we know God cannot treat us unfairly. When we, when we don't like the things that are happening to us, when we watch what's happening to other believers in other parts of the world, and we don't like what's going on, we don't like what providence has brought to us or to others, what are we to do? We do what the psalmists did. We do what the psalmist did. And they take it before the throne of grace. The psalms are filled with the language of people pouring their hearts out to God when the wicked prosper, when they are being persecuted, when there's any number of, of wicked things. The Psalms are full of them. And we can get the language of what to do with our anger. Of course. 
giving the devil no room doesn't just apply to our anger, does it? It applies to all of the places where the devil can try to make a foothold, take room. He applies it next to stealing. Though we could rightly apply that to any number of areas. We could apply it to any of the commands, right? Honor your father and your mother. We could uh, uh, apply it in the area of adultery, in the area of covetousness, in the area of seeking harm to our neighbors. The devil will always try to make room for those things in our lives, and we cannot allow him to do so. We must grow conscious of the fact. We must be alert to the fact that the devil is trying to make room in our lives, and in our hearts, and in our minds. And so we must constantly ask ourselves, where have we allowed the devil to make room? Where have we allowed the devil to make room in our lives? Is it anger? Is it stealing? Is it adultery? Is it how we worship? As I said, the next thing he says is about theft. Let the thief steal no longer. That makes perfect sense, right? I mean, that's one of the commandments, right? Do not steal. Don't take what's not yours. And there's a whole set of ramifications uh, or implications to that. Not just taking of property, but taking of what we would now call intellectual property. You know, we would stealing people's words, taking credits for things, cheating. Let the thief no longer steal. Now here is an example again of the putting off and the putting on. What does he say? But let rather let him labor doing honest work with his hands. So he says, don't just stop stealing. But go and be productive. Work. Earn your money. Don't steal. But for what reason? Not just to stop stealing. He says, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Again, another example of the putting off and the putting on that we ought to engage in as believers. Sometimes we're so focused on not sinning that we're not replacing it. We're not putting anything else on. He says, stop stealing. As a matter of fact, don't just stop stealing, but I want you to go to the other direction. And I want you now to be someone who supplies the needs of others. That's what it means to put off and to put on. now he comes back to these, the idea of our speech and our talk. He says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. I think the force of the Greek there might be a little stronger than just corrupting talk. It's a word that could be translated as rotten. Rotten words. Let no rotten words come out of your mouth. Things that will spoil and putrefy. Putrefy. Corrupt, yes. Anger is one of the many ways and the many times we will be tempted to spew rotten words. I mean, not the only. I mean, there are our Tons of ways for us to spew rotten words. I don't think we have to think too long about that. 
then our speech ought to be one which is seasoned with salt. We're, we're, we're to, to speak in a way not that is like the Gentiles do, not as like the, the world does. But again, he goes further. Paul tells the Ephesians, and by implication, us, that our words are not just supposed to be not rotten, not corrupting, not destructive, but they're to be good for building up, as fit for the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. That it may give grace to those who hear. Put off, put on. Does our speech do that? Do we actively engage in the encouragement and the upbuilding of others? Do we give grace to others? We ought to. I even think of, of those in, in, in Pakistan who are suffering right now, and it would be easy to be someone who would want to curse those who are persecuting them. But in, instead, instead they need to be building up one another, encouraging one another, giving grace to one another, reminding one another of the hope that is yet to come. of the blessings that they have in Christ. The reminder that our persecution is not wasted by God. As we are troubled and trialed in our own lives, we are to speak words of encouragement and grace and upbuilding to one another. And what better way to do that again than to use the words of Scripture itself. He goes on. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit to make sad, to upset the Holy Spirit. See, this is, first of all, as a reminder here. He says, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't just come and go. The Holy Spirit abides with us, marks us out as those who belong to God, and seals us and guarantees that we shall be preserved to the day of our redemption. But see, our, our anger, our sinful actions, our sinful thoughts and attitudes grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not given to us so that we may grieve Him. The Holy Spirit is given to us to produce fruit in us. The very opposite of these things that we are talking about. You might even be able to rattle them off from the top of your head from Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, gentleness, self-control. Those are the things that ought to characterize our lives. Those are the things that don't just not grieve the Spirit, but they bring joy to the Spirit of God within us because we are glorifying God as the Spirit works sanctification in us. See, God wants us to be like that. God wants us to be people of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness. Isn't it wonderful that he doesn't just tell us, well, don't be angry, don't steal, don't lust, 
don't, but, but do all these other things. It's wonderful that he doesn't just tell us to do that, but then he gives us his spirit who then says, ah, I'm here to, to work in you along with the word of God, to sanctify you, to develop you, to, to make you into someone who willfully and joyfully speaks words of encouragement, who helps to bring joy to the mourning heart, peace to the angry and the disturbed. That is the Spirit of God. And again, here is that reminder that we are redeemed, that this isn't just about being a good person. See, pastors, we have to be very careful when we preach the Word of God. That we're not just preaching morality. Morality divorced from the Gospel is nothing. We can preach morality and goodness all we want, but if we fail to preach Christ, we are condemning people to hell who think that they've been good enough. All of these things are meant to be within the context of us as believers seeking to glorify the God who has redeemed us, who has sealed us for the day of redemption. And Paul's going to remind us of that one more time. The, the last verse that we looked at, but we got to look at one more. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander be put away from you, along with all malice. I think this is one of those times where Paul's just trying to catch all. Every kind of, of anger that, that stirs up in our hearts, every type, every type of division and nastiness, every type of killing with our hearts and our words. Remember, Jesus equates hatred with murder in the heart. Bitterness, wrath. I think we, we got those, right? Those are easy. Anger. Clamor may be one that we don't, it doesn't quite as easily come across to us. Clamor is the idea of crying out, an angry shouting, a making a fuss. I think it's even more than throwing a temper tantrum. In today's world, we clamor in so many different ways. We don't even have to open our mouths to clamor anymore. We don't have to be vocal. We can do it with our thumbs and our fingers on our phones through Facebook and Twitter and other types of social media where we can rant and rave and be angry in front of everyone. That's not us. That's not how we are to be. As a matter of fact, we ought to be as God, who has satisfied his wrath toward us. That's why I love that word propitiation in Romans 3.25. The satisfaction of God's wrath. God, in, in for us who are in Christ, his wrath has been satisfied toward us, and that ought to satisfy us. That God's wrath toward us has been satisfied him, so we ought to not be people of wrath. Instead, he says, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another. And here, I want us to keep in mind that it seems like everything that Paul is saying, he's talking about our attitude toward one another within the body of Christ. Now, I, these words make me uncomfortable because I, I know, I know my own heart and I know my own actions and I know when I have acted bitterly and spitefully. And I know when I have withheld forgiveness in my own heart. But he ends this section on, on this great mighty tone of as God in Christ forgave you. Again, tying all of these things in 
to the gospel of Jesus Christ because you have been forgiven, because God is no longer angry with you in your sin. Yes, we can still speak of God disciplining us as a loving father. He is not pleased by our sin, but his anger and his wrath have been satisfied. We're forgiven in Christ. And therefore, we ought to act as those who are forgiven. Just a few thoughts in closing. As Christians, our sin impacts others in the body of Christ. And so does our obedience. That's what Paul wants us to see. Our sin impacts others in the body of Christ, and so does our obedience. Our sin is not only an offense to a holy God and grieving to the Holy Spirit, it harms others. It deprives others in the body of Christ of the things that could be beneficial to their Christian lives. Let us, as, as the people of God, be those who desire to live out the love of God to us, the forgiveness of God, the God, God satisfying his wrath toward us. Let us be those who live that out in such a way that we build up one another. And may that building up be a light to those around us. May God use his transforming of us to glorify himself and others around us, whether they are members of the body, not yet members of the body, or those who oppose Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word and the challenge of it. Lord, help us to understand your will and your way and your purposes. Grant us the grace and strength we need by your spirit and by your word to put off sin in our lives and put on righteousness and holiness. To act as those who are righteous before you, for we have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Pray this, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. This is Pastor Howard Sloan of King of Kings Reformed Church here in Bedford, Pennsylvania. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this sermon today, and I hope it blessed you. If you would like more information about King of Kings Reformed Church, you can visit us on the web at kingofkingsreformed.com, or you can check us out on Facebook at King of Kings Bedford. Either way, I hope you check us out. And may you find the blessing of knowing and being known by our Lord Jesus Christ.